Hello, my name is Phil Parker, and I'm about to introduce you to a series of six videos that describe how to do strategic planning in this field of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Step one is defining your objectives. Without any doubt, this is absolutely the most important step in strategic planning. There are two aspects of this. One is from the leadership position. They'll be thinking about financial and social objectives. And equally important are the deliverables. That's the thought process of the typical application developer. These are the deliverables that include visualizations, apps, robots, etc. We'll begin our discussion with a simple thought experiment. Imagine we're playing a chess game. I'm black and you're white. And I give you the instructions to beat me in four moves. If you don't beat me in four moves, you will lose the game. Okay, now think about it for just a moment. What type of behavior are you likely to have in playing this game? Think of a pawn as a server blade. Think of a knight as a piece of software. Are you going to be passive or are you going to be extremely aggressive? Of course, the answer is you're going to be very aggressive. Not only that, but you're also going to have to assume that Phil doesn't know chess very well. Okay, now I want you to forget everything about the previous game. Here's a new chess game. I want you to take as many pieces off the board as possible, including your own pieces, so that at the end of the game, I win and you lose. If you win the game, you in fact lose the game because you want me to win. This is the game that you play with your children when you want them to learn chess. Otherwise, it's kind of a stupid game. You want the knights and the bishops to fly off the board because that's the fun of the battle. Question, what kind of behavior will you have in this game? Will you be passive or aggressive? Well, the answer is you'll be very aggressive. You have to take pieces off the board, but you also have to take your own pieces off the board, which means you're going to be suicidally aggressive. Now, let's compare the two games. The strategy was radically different. The only thing that changed was me changing the objective. That's why you start with the objective first. It will have a fundamental influence on what chess pieces you move, on what algorithms you choose, on what kind of people you hire, on what kind of software and hardware is ultimately used. Let's go back to the real world. When you ask managers what their real objectives are, they'll typically say things like, well, I want to maximize my market share, or maybe increase my short run profits, or maximize revenues or some other KPI. When you go to people in the machine learning world, they'll talk about graphical user interfaces. They'll talk about fancy curves, maybe using the cloud or maybe using a server, perhaps network architecture. When you probe both the managers and the people who are developing applications, what you discover is that both the managers and the developers both think they're maximizing shareholder value. Maximizing shareholder value is actually a machine learning control problem. So let's pause for a moment and ask ourselves, what is that problem exactly and formulate it? What we're now going to discuss is what I call the equation, the core equation that should drive all decision making in the field of artificial intelligence or machine learning. This is going to be intensive. So if there's a moment to pause this video and take a biology break, now's that time. Okay, let's do this. We're gonna go back to some high school mathematics here. We're gonna start with the symbol pi for profit. And what we wanna do is maximize that profit. If you remember the sigmas from high school where we're summing up things, there are three key sigmas. The first sigma is we have to decide in which countries do we want this application to be used in. Just because we're targeting China, for example, doesn't mean that our products or services are going to be sold to all people in China. We then have to decide which segments we are going to target, maybe 10 or so. After we decided we want to target, let's say, teenagers, in China, we have to decide what the products and services and or applications we're going to deploy for that segment in that country. These three sigmas are typically called a product marketer's portfolio. Okay, from that portfolio, we're going to be discounting cash flows from today to some time horizon T. We're going to discount those cash flows using a discount rate. If you're not sure, just put 10% and add 0.23 to make it look like you calculated it. For each product that we sell, there's going to be a price, and we're going to subtract the marginal cost off of that price 
That's called the margin. We're going to multiply that margin by the amount of units that we actually sell. And that's called the gross profit. What's missing, of course, is the overheads. That we're going to call fixed cost. When you subtract your fixed cost from your gross profits, you end up getting your net profits. Now, my brother Jay, he's an anesthesiologist, and he says, Phil, how can you spend so much time on business? Isn't business kind of trivial? You basically have to sell something to somebody somewhere. Buy low, sell high, but don't spend too much money doing it. Yep, that's pretty much it. But there is a problem. What's the optimal price? Well, infinite, of course. What's the optimal marginal cost? Now, that would be zero. And what's the optimal fixed cost? That would be zero as well. Selling oxygen to everyone everywhere at an infinite price is the ultimate business model. The only problem is that, well, price actually affects the units you sell. If you charge too high, no one's going to buy your product. As you sell more products, your marginal cost might go down. As you expand internationally, your fixed costs go up. That also will have an effect on the units you sell. Therefore, there are three constraints. These constraints are represented in three functions. Your units are a function of, for example, your marketing strategy. Your marginal costs are a function of your materials, maybe the volume of what you produce and the technology you use to produce them. And your fixed cost, of course, might be a function of your portfolio or of your creativity. Now the question is, can you mathematically solve this problem? Go back to your office, create a spreadsheet, and just crank it out. The answer is yes, because that is your job. The only real question is, how are you going to solve this problem? And the answer is, you are going to guess, but with style. And what do consulting firms call style? They call them frameworks. The bad news is, no matter what answer you come up with for the optimal product, place, price, materials, volume, technology, no matter what you come up with, someone is going to be pissed off at you. Why is that? Because at the very top of management, you have what are called shareholders. Shareholders are busy. They don't have time to solve this equation. So you know what they do? They outsource it to the board. Board member, busy. So what do they do? Outsource it to a CEO. CEO is busy, busy. So they outsource it to the CFO, the CEO, the CTO, etc. That gets outsourced to who? These executive senior vice president. Eventually, a manager is in charge of this project. Unfortunately, these different people don't necessarily have the same time horizon. Sales people, for example, have extremely short time horizon. As you move up in the organization, the time horizon is longer and longer. Therefore, it's critical up front to understand who are you developing this technology, this application for. Is it for the C-suite or is it for salespeople? If you're developing for the C-suite, you're going to have plenty of time to invest in long-run technologies. If, however, you need to have sales come in quickly in a short horizon, probably you're going to do a very quick and dirty application. Now, this is a fairly simplified version of shareholder value. Many organizations have social values as well. Maybe they want to cure polio. Maybe they have some community agenda. I will add to the top equation lambda feel-good factor. Lambda signifies other things. Now, in my opinion, CEOs should have this equation tattooed on their foreheads backwards. So every morning when they wake up and look in the mirror, they know the objective of the day. You will probably never see this equation ever again. Nobody uses this formulaic structure when they're running a business. Rather, what you typically hear is something about a company's aspirations, its mission or vision. Now, many people think that a firm's aspiration is largely developed by a communications department and has very little influence on the firm itself. Well, if they're correctly written, they can have a massive impact on the way people apply artificial intelligence and machine learning. Let's use INSEAD as an example. We have a mission statement. Let's say it says something like, to educate the world's business leaders. Now, pause the video. Go back. Look at the equation. Try to recognize how this mission statement maps into the equation. If you take your time, you'll realize that it's nothing more than the sigma, sigma, sigma. The first sigma, what is our geography? That's the world. Second sigma, what is the segment we're targeting? That would be business leaders. 
And third, what's the product or service that we're actually offering? That would be education. Well-written mission statements actually are a constraint on what an organization can do. If someone's application in artificial intelligence does not fit within these constraints, it's probably not accomplishing the mission of the organization. The second component of aspirations is typically the vision. This is a forecast of the future. And in Siad's case, we might have a vision like to be the world's most reputable business school. Okay, pause the video for a second. Look at the previous slide and then ask yourself, how does this vision meet or intersect with the equation? If you take your time, you'll notice that it's nothing more than a statement of our cash flow. We want to be the world's most reputable business school. Okay, so what kind of price do you think we might have? Probably fairly high. Are we going to pay our faculty well? That's our marginal cost. Yeah, probably we will because we want to have reputation, which means what? We probably won't sell that many units. And in order to keep our reputation high, we might what? Increase our fixed costs. Have a nice restaurant. Have nice amphitheaters. Which means what? Our profits are likely to be low. Which makes sense. We are a non-profit organization with really nice food and really happy faculty. The third component is often called values or how do you hope to meet your mission or vision. And that involves ethics values. It may be something broader, like we want to build a nation. This is called the lambda factor. So what you see is this aspiration itself is a constrained optimization problem. If artificial intelligence and machine learning cannot help you in this regard, then do not bother. Now, what you'll notice is missions change from time to time. So sometimes you might use artificial intelligence, other times not. Visions, however, are far more strategic. They don't change that often, but they do give you an opportunity to think about applications that wouldn't be normally thought of in a normal course of events. And then finally, values are more lasting. They're here forever. If an artificial intelligence bot violates your values, then you definitely should not invest in that project. Okay, how do we apply these concepts in a real world setting? My recommendation is organize an objectives workshop. You'll probably invite key stakeholders within the organization. They may come from finance, marketing, corporate counsel, and others who have some influence on the mission, vision, or aspirations of the organization. Each stakeholder should be asked to express their time horizons as specifically as possible and the KPIs as well in terms of profits, market shares, sales, again, as specifically as possible. At the same time, in the same room, hopefully with many whiteboards and flip charts, you'll have the development team, the data scientists, the experts on artificial intelligence within your organization, and you will together co-create rough drafts of the actual deliverables. The deliverables are in fact a mirror of the financial objectives. There's an assumption that if you want to increase sales, for example, we can deliver it via, for example, a dashboard or something like that. You would need to actually have a rough draft of those dashboards, those apps, those graphical user interfaces, maybe even a drawing of a robot. You want to have that upfront so it becomes clear how the objectives are going to be met with some specific application of artificial intelligence. I cannot stress too much how important this is. You do not want to wait three months into the project to find out that people are spending their time on something that doesn't come close to meeting the objectives that are financial or social in nature. All right, there's a five-step process to developing a strategy in artificial intelligence. The first step is simply knowing what you want to achieve, what are your financial and social objectives. At the same moment, you're going to write on a whiteboard what the applications, the robots, the new technologies you're going to develop in order to meet those objectives. You need to do this before you purchase any equipment, any software, or work with any vendor. Furthermore, as we saw from the chess game analogy, the more you can specifically define your objectives, the more likely it'll be easy to choose the appropriate methodology at the lowest possible cost.